Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, so that means it's time for a new video. Today, we're going to be looking at medieval Jewish-Christian relations. In particular, we're going to take a look at official church policy towards the Jews in medieval Europe, and how the church responded to increasing acts of violence against Jews in the later Middle Ages. You may note up front that this video is considerably longer than the first two. You know, at this point in the early days of this channel, I'm sort of trying out a lot of different formats, seeing what people like and don't like. So, you know, if this is too long for you and you're not interested, you know, let me know that in the comments. If you like that it's long, let me know that too. This video is mostly going to focus on the dark side of medieval Jewish-Christian relations. In particular, we're going to look at various events that interrupted what were normally fairly peaceful relations between the two groups, Rest assured, in the future, I'll also do a video on the positive side of their relationships. But the main question I have here today is, was the medieval church anti-Semitic? To answer that question, we have to define anti-Semitism. That might sound like an easy enough task, but it is something scholars have struggled to firmly define. The definition I'm operating under here is that of Gavin Langmeier, who wrote the following in his book, History, Religion, and Anti-Semitism. He says, anti-Semitism is defined as chimerical and fantastical beliefs about Jews and as irrational beliefs that attribute to all those symbolized as Jews menacing characteristics or conduct that no Jews have observed to possess or engage in. So for Langmeier, there's a big difference between anti-Semitism and what he calls anti-Judaism, and I agree with him. The main difference between the two is that there's some actual foundation of reality in ideas that are anti-Jewish. Anti-Judaism is founded on the reality that Jews are in fact not Christians and that they have a different culture and different beliefs. The major feeling associated with anti-Judaism tends to be frustration on the part of Christians that Jews are unwilling to convert. And as Langmeier defines it, anti-Semitism is based on fantastical accusations and conspiracy theories that have no real basis in fact. Now, of course, anti-Judaism is not a good thing either, but the distinction between the two is important because when anti-Judaism transforms into anti-Semitism, that's where we begin to see violence committed against Jewish communities in the Middle Ages. As we move through the Middle Ages in this video, these two definitions will become clearer as we'll see some concrete examples of both. Now that we have our definition squared away, let's talk about Jewish-Christian relations in late antiquity, roughly the years between 1 and 500 CE and the period that comes right before the Middle Ages. So a video that goes deep on the parting of the ways, you know, when Christianity and Judaism became distinct from one another is something I'll do in the future, but for now, let me sum this up. Jesus was Jewish. He wanted to reform Judaism. There were different competing thoughts on Judaism at the time in many different sects. Some thought of the temple as the most important aspect, others thought of Jewish law as the most important aspect, and still others emphasized mysticism. Jesus, meanwhile, wanted there to be a focus, a greater focus, on ethical living, and he spoke of an immortal soul that would receive rewards in the afterlife if you were a good person. In short, his ideas were not accepted by most Jews for a variety of reasons, and his presence began to concern the Jewish elites in society, as well as the Romans, and he was executed. According to the Bible, he was resurrected 48 hours later, proving he was the Messiah. Within a few decades, Christianity became a clearly distinct religion from Judaism. For its first few hundred years, Christianity was sporadically persecuted by the Romans, while Jews were accepted by the Romans. Things eventually changed, though. In the early 4th century, the Roman Empire began a process of Christianization, and suddenly, Jews were a minority culture living in a Christian world. The question now arose for Christians, what do we do about Jews? The early answers to this varied, but one of the more common ideas was to get them to convert by any means necessary, including force. The 4th century saw this activity become increasingly popular, but in the 5th century, one of the most important thinkers in the history of Christianity, and really, in the history of the world, formulated a plan for how Jews should be treated in the Christian world. That man was St. Augustine of Hippo. His writings were highly influential, and medieval people viewed him as an absolute authority on many things. Here's what he had to say about Jews in Christian society. He wrote, The Jews who killed him, who refused to believe in him, and who refused to believe that he had to die and to rise again, suffered an even more wretched devastation at the hands of the Romans. Utterly uprooted from their kingdom, they were dispersed the whole world over. Indeed, there is no part of the earth where they are not found. Thus, by the evidence of their own scriptures, they bear witness for us 
that we have not fabricated the prophecies about Christ. Slay them not, it says, lest at some point they forget your law. Scatter them by your might. And there he's quoting Psalm 59, verse 12. So, for Augustine, Jews should certainly not be eliminated or forcibly converted. Some of this has to do with ethics, but most importantly, it has to do with the important missionary purpose that Jews could serve. They were an ancient religion, known to most pagans in the Roman Empire, and they could point to their ancient texts and argue that Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. Elsewhere, Augustine elaborated that he didn't think Jews should be persecuted or forcibly converted, but he thought it was necessary that they exist in a lesser state than their Christian neighbors, because that would at least provide some motivation for conversion. Additionally, Augustine felt that Jews would eventually convert to Christianity anyway, just that it would be a very gradual process that would really only be completed at the time of the second coming of Christ. In short, Augustine's argument was that Jews should be an accepted minority in Christian society. By the late 6th century, Pope Gregory I began to take actions reflecting his acceptance of Augustine's ideas. He condemned many churchmen who had forcibly converted the Jews and wrote the following. Although Jews prefer to persist in their obstinance rather than acknowledge the words of the prophets and the eternal secrets of their own scriptures, in view of the fact that they have begged for our protection and our aid in accordance with the clemency which Christian piety imposes on us, we grant their petition and offer them the shield of our protection. No Christian shall presume to wound their persons or kill them or rob them of their money or change the good customs which they have thus far enjoyed. Furthermore, while they celebrate their festivals, no one shall disturb them in any way. We oppose the wickedness and avarice of evil men in such matters. No one shall dare to desecrate or reduce a Jewish cemetery. Should anyone nevertheless dare to act in defiance, which God has forbidden, he shall suffer loss of honor and office, or be restrained by the penalty of excommunication. A key thing here is that Gregory is wielding the most powerful weapon in his arsenal, excommunication. That was not a small thing for medieval people. If you were excommunicated, you were no longer part of the church, which meant you could not take part in communion and the other sacraments, and you'd be shunned from society. Elsewhere, Gregory also stated that Jews should not be put in positions of power over Christians. For example, he forbade Jews from owning Christian slaves, employing Christians, or working for secular governments. Gregory is, of course, also careful to note just how wrong Jews are from his perspective, but it is important that he thinks Jews and Christians should coexist, and Christians should leave Jews alone. So, Augustine argued that Jews should be an accepted minority within society, and Gregory I made it clear that they were a protected minority as well. At this time, I'd like to show you two figures that appear with regularity in medieval art. They're called Ecclesia and Synagoga. These two figures are allegorical representations of the church and synagogue, and they go a long way towards explaining medieval Jewish-Christian relations and the way medieval Christians thought about their Jewish neighbors. First, let's look at an image I already showed earlier in this video, a manuscript illumination depicting Christ's crucifixion. On the left, there's a woman wearing a crown and holding a chalice. This is Ecclesia, the representation of the church. On the right, there's a woman holding a banner with a broken rod, and she's blindfolded and turning away from the crucifixion. This is Synagoga. The two figures appear in many crucifixion scenes, such as the one you see here, with the basic message being that Ecclesia believes firmly in the crucifixion, so much so that she is gathering Christ's blood into a chalice for communion. Meanwhile, Synagoga refuses to acknowledge what is happening and is blind to the truth. This conveys the obstinance that Gregory was talking about. The more famous examples of these figures appear as monumental sculptures on Gothic cathedrals in the later Middle Ages. The one you see here is at Notre Dame in Paris, and they date to the 13th century. These sculptures convey a similar message, with a lot of symbolism used to convey the relationship between church and synagogue. In this case, the figures exist on opposite sides of one of the doors of the cathedral, and they exist fairly independently, not surrounding a crucifixion like we saw earlier. You have Ecclesia on the left. She has a halo, she's wearing a crown, she's holding a chalice that symbolizes communion, and she has a large staff with a cross on it. Meanwhile, with Synagoga, there is an indication that she once had a crown, but it's fallen off. She also has a broken banner, and she's once again completely blindfolded. The Notre Dame version of Synagoga is unique in that there is actually a serpent blinding Synagoga. The overall message here, that the synagogue and Jews 
used to be the chosen people of God. That's when Synagoga was a queen wearing a crown, just like Ecclesia has now. But now the church has arrived, and Christians are the new chosen people of God, and they have superseded Jews, who, either because of the interference of Satan or their own obstinance, don't understand what's in their own scriptures. So the message conveyed in this artwork is in many ways a visual representation of what Gregory and Augustine wrote. Jews are obstinate, and they're in a weakened state as a result of their refusal to convert, but they can and should be allowed to coexist with Christians too. After all, ecclesia and synagogue coexist, but one is in a much better position than the other. So at this point, everything we've talked about can be called anti-Judaism, based on our definition. Jews were treated the way they were for actual documented theological differences. It is not the result of chimerical fantasies where Jews are accused of doing all sorts of violent and crazy things. Again, I do want to stress that this doesn't mean that Jews being treated this way was right. It just means that there aren't fantastical accusations associated with their treatment, and as we'll see, fantastical accusations lead to a much worse outcome for medieval Jews. This would all begin to shift in the 11th century, and it seems to have done so in conjunction with Europeans becoming increasingly concerned about Islam. The very first time we see sort of mob violence directed against the Jewish community is in 1026. That year, Al-Hakam destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This was the most important place in all of Christendom, a church complex that contained the site believed to be where Christ was crucified, as well as his tomb. Al-Hakam was unusual for his time, as other Muslim leaders before and after him tolerated Christianity as well as Judaism. So a lot of medieval Christians weren't super concerned about Islam up until this point, and after his death, Christians would be allowed to rebuild the church. But the important thing for us here is that when word reached Europe of this catastrophe, somehow Jews became part of the narrative. This did not result in violence everywhere, but in 1026 in the French city of Limoges, it resulted in the first time that Jews were accused of being enemies of Christianity who were out to destroy it. And a few dozen Jews were killed by a mob with others taking their own lives. We know from the many sources we have of Al-Hakam's destruction of the church that Jews were not involved at all. In fact, Al-Hakam persecuted Jews too. But somehow, in the mind of many medieval Christians, Jews and Muslims began to be conflated together. It seems that concern about a non-Christian group abroad resulted in a new level of concern about non-Christians in Europe itself. Still, the good news is that the events of 1026 were isolated, and things went back to normal for several decades, that is, until the Crusades began. In 1095, Pope Urban II called for the First Crusade. This armed pilgrimage was to go to the Levant, help the Byzantine Emperor against invasions from the Seljuk Turks, and get the Holy Land back into Christian hands. Urban II didn't say anything about Jews in his speech, and like most popes, he promised to protect Jews and threatened excommunication against those who broke the rules. But the religious zeal that was stirred up by Urban II had an unforeseen consequence. Some people who went on crusade decided they would attack Jews in Europe on their way to the Holy Land. In 1096, we have our first large-scale massacre of Jews, concentrated in the Rhineland region, where it's likely that as many as 10,000 Jews were killed. And what were the reasons for this? Well, there are several Hebrew chronicles of this crusade, and here's what one of these chroniclers says that these crusaders said during their actions against the Jews. Look now, we're going a long way to seek out the profane shrine and to avenge our cause on the Ishmaelites. When here, in our very midst, are the Jews, they whose forefathers murdered and crucified him for no reason, let us first avenge ourselves on them and exterminate them from among the nations so that the name of Israel will no longer be remembered. It should be noted that this is not the first time Jews are collectively accused of bearing the blame for Jesus' death. This is something we saw earlier when Augustine discussed the issue, and it is something that is at least alluded to in the Gospels. In reality, it was really only the elites of Jewish society that wanted Jesus to be executed and not the entire community, and of course the Romans also played a significant role. But regardless of the reality, people like Augustine and Gregory believed the punishment Jews had received, being scattered throughout the world and losing their temple, was enough, and it was not right to harm Jews in the present for the actions of Jews in the past. However, the Crusaders who attacked the cities in the Rhineland disagreed. 
They begin to cast all Jews as very real enemies of Christianity within their own time, and that is an important distinction. At this point, we're seeing the beginnings of anti-Semitism. Jews are now being attacked not for any theological reason, but because they're viewed as inherently bad beings who want to destroy and harm Christianity. From this point on, medieval Jewish-Christian relations continued to deteriorate. And while it is worth noting, again, that Jews and Christians at various places in medieval Europe got along and were even friends and business partners, among other things, there were an increasing amount of fantastical accusations against the Jews, all of which cast them as wanting to destroy Christianity. To check in with the church, it is worth noting that the papacy condemned the attacks on Jews in both of these cases, and secular governments did the same thing. These massacres were largely the result of religious fanaticism among the common people, not the higher-ups in society. In fact, it is worth noting that bishops in most of the towns in the Rhineland did their best to try to protect the Jewish community from these attacks. So let's move forward now to the 12th century when we have a new type of accusation arise against the Jews, that of ritual murder. This accusation first emerged in England, in the city of Norwich specifically. In 1144, a local boy named William was found dead in the woods and some said that the Jews must have been the culprits. Ultimately, this accusation never really went anywhere with the local authorities saying that isn't what happened. However, a few years later, there was renewed interest in this accusation as a newcomer to Norwich, a monk named Thomas of Monmouth, began to investigate. He eventually concluded, after trying to figure out what happened, that Jews were indeed responsible. And not only that, they treated the boy as if he were Jesus, reenacting the crucifixion with him as they killed him. William recorded this in a text called The Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich, which was widely circulated. One of his star witnesses in the text is a fellow monk who claims to have converted to Christianity from Judaism. And according to this monk, when he was still Jewish, a representative from every community would travel to Cordoba, Spain and draw straws. Whoever drew the short straw that year had to ritually sacrifice a Christian child as part of their Passover celebrations. Notably, this is the first time in history that we see an accusation of a worldwide conspiracy of Jews. In the end, Thomas's text didn't gain a ton of traction in Norwich. There was an attempt to assert this child as a martyr saint, and some people believed the story, but in the end, no action was taken against Jews, as local authorities didn't believe that it had occurred the way Thomas said. However, even if it didn't take hold in Norwich, it did elsewhere. It was copied and spread throughout Europe, and everywhere we can find the story traveling, an accusation against the Jews occurred. First, this happened in England, first in Norwich, of course, and then in places like Bury St. Edmunds. But again, no violence occurred against Jews as a result. However, in 1171, the accusation jumped across the English Channel into France. That year, in Blois, the Jews were accused of killing a Christian child, solely based on the testimony of a young boy who claimed he saw a Jew dispose of a child in the river. Notably, no child in the community was missing, and there was no other evidence but the accusation took hold this time, and 30 Jews in the community were executed, making them the first victims of this type of accusation. Ritual murder accusations continued to spread throughout Europe and occurred sporadically, with Jews executed in connection with the accusation in some cases. It should be noted that the papacy opposes these ritual murder accusations, but after a few decades, we start to see a shift in papal policy towards the Jews, that indicates growing concern about their presence. It's in 1199 that we have the first hint that the papacy is also beginning to view Jews as potential enemies to Christianity. That year, a fairly new pope, Innocent III, reissued a bull of protection for the Jewish community. This was something virtually every pope had done, following the precedent set by Gregory the Great. However, Innocent added a very important phrase. At the end, he notes, we wish, however, to place under the protection of this decree only those Jews who have not presumed to plot against the Christian faith. That's a pretty big however, and one that would create a potential loophole for Christians to violate the terms of the protective bull. Innocent III's papacy in general marks a major transition in the way the church viewed the Jews of Europe, though at least he does not believe that all Jews collectively are capable of such a thing. In 1215, at the Fourth Lateran Council, Innocent issued several canons that further indicated concern with Jews as figures who are dangerous to Christianity. Among the restrictions were requirements to wear distinctive clothing, with the idea being that they would help prevent interfaith relationships, which greatly concerned Innocent. Another restriction was that Jews had to be in their homes during church processions, specifically because of a concern that they might do something to stop them. 
Church processions were very common. If you take a look at the Catholic calendar, you'll see a lot of holidays. So that was no small thing where Jews had to stay in their home just a couple times a year. So at this point, we can see that medieval Christians are shifting towards anti-Semitism. We see it in the accusation of ritual murder, which is no doubt chimerical and fantastical. And we even see the papacy begin to shift a little bit in its policies towards Jews, now starting to be concerned that Jews could be people who are going to plot against Christianity. Still, Innocent did also issue bulls in response to ritual murder accusations, telling the accusers that they were wrong, so there's a degree of ambivalence. In 1235, a new variant of the accusation emerged in the German city of Fulda. There, Jews were accused of not only ritually murdering a Christian child, but also of ritually consuming the blood of the child by cooking it into their Passover matzah. This transforms an accusation from ritual murder to blood libel. Jews in Fulda were rounded up and executed following this supposed event. At this point, the church more firmly stepped in and conducted an investigation, as did the Holy Roman Emperor. In the end, they both came away with the conclusion that the accusation was false and also nonsensical. As part of their observances of dietary restrictions, Jews are not able to consume the blood of animals, so it didn't make much sense that they'd be able to consume the blood of human beings. Miri Rubin, in her book Gentile Tales, has, correctly I think, argued that the accusation is actually a result of internal Christian anxiety about the doctrine of transubstantiation, the idea that when a priest performs a sacrament of the Eucharist, the wafer and wine literally transform into the body and blood of Christ. This only became official church doctrine at the Fourth Lateran Council, the same council we mentioned earlier. Her argument is that Christians internalized the anxiety they had about consuming blood themselves and then projected it onto their Jewish neighbors. In this case, the papacy became very opposed to these types of accusations to a much greater extent than they did ritual murder. Starting with the papacy of Innocent IV, accusations of ritual murder and blood libel began to appear regularly in protective bulls popes issued. In other words, if you brought these accusations against Jews, you could risk being excommunicated. So the next new type of accusation that emerged against Jews would be host desecration. Most scholars agree that the first time this accusation occurred for sure was in Paris in 1290, though there are some later documents purporting that an accusation may have occurred in 1243 in Bilitz, Germany. But the case in Paris is definitely the first time we see heavy documentation of the event, as well as a papal response. Host desecration is the act of stealing the communion wafer and then doing something to try to destroy it. The 14th century work of art you see here depicts the three stages of the supposed events of the 1290 host desecration in Paris. On the far left, you have a Jew bribing a Christian woman to bring him a consecrated communion wafer. In the middle, you have him stabbing the wafer with a knife while it bleeds, but it can't be destroyed. He then throws the wafer in a boiling cauldron where it transforms into the Christ child. On the right, you have the son and wife of the Jew seeing what happened and looking shocked. The story concludes with the son and wife converting to Christianity, convinced by the miracle, while the Jewish father still doesn't believe in Christianity and remains obstinate. This is another accusation not only that Jews are trying to destroy Christianity, but they have an incessant need to harm Christ himself. This accusation is particularly fascinating, and if you want to know more about it, once again, I recommend Miri Rubin's book Gentile Tales, which argues that these accusations are also a result of the shift towards transubstantiation. Host desecration accusations, if you think about it, help prove this very idea. One of the interesting things here is that this would imply that Jews actually believe in transubstantiation themselves, since if it were just a regular old wafer, they would have no interest in trying to destroy it at least in the thinking of medieval Christians. The reason Jews want to take it and stab it is because they want to harm Christ. Jews who were accused of host desecration were often executed or killed by angry mobs. The papacy was not nearly as clearly opposed to this type of accusation as the others we've discussed so far, which makes some sense. If the church said these stories aren't true, it might risk people thinking that transubstantiation itself is false. These stories, as I said, actually help prove it. And instead of just staying silent on the issue, Pope Boniface VIII wrote the following in response to a petition for a chapel to be built on the site of the 1290 host desecration. Pope Boniface receives the petition from a citizen of Paris regarding a miracle involving the holy wafer. Some Jews had pierced the wafer with a knife and then put it in furiously boiling water, whereupon the water miraculously turned to blood. The petitioner would like to build a chapel on the spot where the miracle occurred and support it out of his own funds. 
The Pope praises this citizen for his zeal and orders the Bishop of Paris to let him establish the chapel. Like ritual murder and blood libel accusations, host desecration accusations also quickly spread throughout the rest of Europe, sometimes resulting in wide-scale violence against Jews. However, by the 14th century, the papacy began to oppose these accusations as attacks against Jews intensified as a result of host desecration accusations. In 1338, Pope Benedict XII ordered a detailed investigation into a host desecration accusation in the city of Polkow. In its preliminary stages, fraud was uncovered, and Benedict ordered that anyone who brought the false accusation against the Jews would be punished, and this became the standard way the papacy would deal with future accusations. Still, it took them about 40 years to condemn this type of accusation. So, this brings us to the last big wave of accusations and massacres of the Middle Ages, this time we're talking about the 14th century, and in particular, the time during which plague was tearing through Europe. Starting around 1346, plague came to Europe across the Silk Road. The 13th and 14th centuries saw increasing contacts between Asia and Europe, and this resulted in important technology coming to Europe, like Chinese printing, paper, and gunpowder, but it also led to plague coming to Europe, where people had no real immunity. One in three Europeans died from this disease. The 14th century was, in general, a chaotic time. A horrible famine had also occurred earlier in the century, and people were trying to find a way out of this horrible situation. Under torture, a Jewish merchant said that he poisoned wells throughout his trade route by putting spiders and frogs in them, and this is what caused plague. Jews were collectively blamed by what this Jew said, and they were attacked throughout Europe on the greatest scale in the history of Judaism before the 20th century. So why did Jews get the blame here? Well, there are a few factors. One of these is simply that, as we've seen, anti-Semitic accusation against Jews were already floating around, so it made sense to anyone who viewed them as enemies of Christianity that this could be their fault. And by blaming the Jews, medieval Christians make themselves feel like they have control over the situation, over the plague, which was a situation they had absolutely no control over. But if they could blame the Jews for it and eliminate them, and that would fix plague, it made them feel like they could do something about it. Another reason Jews may have been accused, they generally practiced better hygiene than their Christian counterparts, as ritual immersion in a bath called a mikvah is part of Jewish observance, as is regular cleaning of the home ahead of the Sabbath. This led to Jews not suffering quite as much from the plague as Christians, which would seem suspicious to anyone looking to blame them. It is notable, though, that lots of Jews died from plague, too. It isn't like they were completely immune. So the scale of violence in the mid-14th century was unprecedented. How did the church respond to this? By condemning the attacks. In 1348, Pope Clement VI wrote the following to bishops and other religious officials throughout Europe. Recently, a public outcry came to our attention that some Christians, who have been deceived by the devil, blamed the plague on poisons from Jews, and then in impious temerity attacked and killed some of these Jews, despite the fact that the plague is caused by the sins of the people, and in many and various parts of the world that do not have Jews, the plague still afflicts the community. Therefore, we order you to warn those who are subject to you against hitting, injuring, or killing these Jews. So, let's get back to our opening question. Was the medieval church anti-Semitic? It isn't really a question with a straight-up yes or no answer. There's a lot of nuance here. Normally, as we've seen, the church spoke out strongly against fantastical accusations against Jews as enemies of Christianity. And remember, our definition of anti-Semitism requires those types of accusations. Otherwise, we call it anti-Judaism. However, a few of the church's actions certainly seem to indicate a leaning in that direction, especially during the papacy of Innocent III, since he expressed in a variety of ways a concern about Jews plotting against Christianity. This isn't quite as strong as destroying it, but it isn't far either. Additionally, the church was very slow to react when it came to host desecration and even praised the stories and building of chapels to commemorate it. So, to put it another way, the answer is mostly no. The medieval church was not anti-Semitic. In fact, with those few exceptions, they seem to have done whatever they could to stand against anti-Semitic accusations. This was largely the official position. As we saw, they spoke out against the 11th century attacks against Jews that seemed to be connected with anti-Muslim sentiment. They opposed accusations of ritual murder once they became more extreme. They opposed accusations of blood libel from the beginning. And they strongly stood against accusations of well poisoning. So that's an overview of the various problems Jewish communities in medieval Europe encountered and how the church responded to them. Next week, we're going to take a break from religious history. Instead, we're going to look at the Viking Age 
and what it was that made Vikings such a problem for other medieval Europeans. That's it for this week's video, though. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like it and share it so that other people can enjoy it, too. If you want to make sure you stay aware of future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching. <laughs>